I'm drinking out of a Christmas mug today, don't judge me. So we are in a different location again, and the hair is going through something even more weird today but hi everyone my name is charlie and i have new windows so this has been a long time coming back in september maybe at some point we realized that there was a lot of damp going on in here now i've known that my windows have not been the best for a very long time because even when the curtains were closed if it was a windy day out there there would be a breeze in my bedroom the curtains could be closed, the windows could be closed. And so it transpired that there was something wrong with the frame. They've sorted that, they've put new glass in. Hopefully it works. Hopefully these windows are going to be like they, you know, they, I can already see that there's a hole in the, whatever they put around the frame to make sure that it's sticking in there. I don't know, but they tell you all this stuff, don't they? They give you this old diatribe about how they'll keep you warm in winter and they'll keep you cool in summer. I'm not quite sure our windows achieve this, but that's what they tell you that windows do. Originally, I believe that they were coming here today, Wednesday. And so I didn't plan on clearing this room until yesterday because all I had to do was, my biggest issue is books. I have books stacked everywhere because I have no room on the bookcases anymore. Like, I, I can see there's a gap here, but we'll get to that in a minute. I had books stacked everywhere and no room on shelves, so I've had to get them into boxes and crates, and I also needed to make space so that the people can access the windows, because they do it all from indoors. And I had my grandfather's dressing table in front of these windows. This dressing table has been getting moved into my mother's room for at least 10 years now. And she has now cleared a space, so I just need to get all of the books off it, go through the drawers and it's gone and I'm looking forward to that not because I don't like having my grandfather's dressing table in here it takes up a lot of space and I never really use it for what it's supposed to be used for and my mother will one get joy out of having her father's dressing table in her room and she will also have more space to put her clothes and she will actually use the mirrors the mirrors are currently behind my wardrobe so we'll see those gone as well on Sunday, because my mother had told us incorrectly, I had to get this room clear. It was a bit of a mad dash. I shoved an audio book on, which is The We Free Men by Terry Pratchett, because I realised that I didn't listen to any Terry Pratchett at all in 2022. They've now started releasing the new audio books, and I think that I might want to listen to them at some point to see what I think to the new audio books in comparison to Nigel Planer and is it Stephen Briggs? So I started listening to that, um, enjoying that, and I got this room sorted. I have found that there is a loose fo floorboard beneath my bed that comes up entirely. So, you know, there's part of me that wants to move everything and I'll take a look to see if there's anything that I've lost in my youth under there. I can't remember where I was going with that train of thought, but I had to move the dressing table. And I'm lazy, I did not want to empty this dressing table of stuff, so I decided that I was going to heft this dressing table. It got caught on a screw in the floor, and I have now given myself a nice bit of pain in the back of my leg. But as you know, I had physio today, so hopefully that will all be sorted out soon. And actually, I got told that this is my final physio appointment. I've only had three, it used to get six, but now due to the way things run with the NHS, I only get three. And I blame the government, that's all I can say about it, but I also don't think that I need any more than this three. I am, um, the physiotherapist did ask me, and you know, as I said to you last time, my pain is ever present, it doesn't go away. Um, but, I was able to walk faster around Mac Forest, not just yesterday, but last week as well. And I still get back and I'm finding that I can be not stiff, but it feels like there is a present ache over the joint. But I'm not going to stop walking. And as I told you previously, we're just working on strengthening the muscles surrounding my knees uh, due to the fact that the bone and the cartilage is wearing away. But in terms of the right knee, that isn't a significant change in six years. So hopefully I've still got quite a few years before I would have to think about having it hoovered out or having an entire replacement. So, you know, if, if I can at least get into my 40s before having to have something done to my knees, then that's fine. But otherwise, I don't really know that I have any other life 
updates for you. I could go with um, the fact that I am hosting Poems and Pints tonight and last week I remember talking about the fact that there were only a few people signed up for it. That's changed. Joy sent me a message from her holiday in Greece to inform me that a few more people have signed up and that we might only be able to get around once and I'm like, you do not know me at all. You do not know me at all. You are not leaving me in charge and we're only going to go around once. I will say to them, all poetry, no preamble, get on with it. I will make sure that we get around twice, whether it hurts me. Even if I don't get to read twice, as long as everybody else has had the opportunity, I am fine with that. I'll be taking stuff to read, obviously. I think that there's a chance that a person who's written down, you know, some people register themselves as coming to read and then they don't turn up. It's going to be fine. And then tomorrow I will be attending the awards evening for the Cheshire Prize for Literature. I don't know if I've won anything. I might not have won anything. I um, don't, but for me, I want to go so that I can see who else is writing poetry in the surrounding areas. I want to go and meet some po poets that I haven't seen in ages because um, when I was first starting out writing poetry, I had a lot of friends who would drive me over to that part of the county and I never drive down myself and you know I, I probably should have reciprocated I should have said to them would you like me to drive you now but also I'm not very good with passengers in my car either way that's it for life and uh, we'll talk about writing in a minute because right now I want to talk about Excellent Women by Barbara Pym because I finished reading this book about 20 minutes ago and it was just the thing that I needed to read for the last week. It's incredibly short, 280 pages. It is one of those books that I have been wanting to get through, get through, get to for ages on the recommendation of Sean of Shaun the Book Maniac and Sarah of Hardcover Hearts and more recently a volunteer who comes in on Friday the volunteer's enthusiasm for Barbara Pym fueled my want to read Excellent Women. This volunteer can recite entire plots and character, and, and it's like she knows these characters personally from the amount of times she has read Barbara Pym. I was astounded when I started talking about Excellent Women on Friday and she could remember the characters instantly. She could tell me about their lives. It, it's like the way that I am with Dinner Ladies that I've seen it so many times. I am just so wholeheartedly invested in the lives of these people despite the fact that I know how things are going to go. And this volunteer almost denigrates the way that they look at Pe Barbara Pym because they say that it's not the best writing in the world but there's just something that she adores about the writing and I can understand it. This is one of those writers who's writing books in a fashion that I wish I could write them. It is a book in which we have the character of Mildred Lathbury, who is seen as one of these excellent women, who is friends with the vicar and his sister. She's unmarried and she's seen as going to be this person who is a perpetual spinster who just helps out around the village, the town, whatever it is. And she's notably kind, but indistinguishable from various other women around about. That really helps the reader because it gives us this blank canvas of a character really that we can empathise with because we don't know the characters in this world. So we just see Mildred navigating the world from the eye voice and she is telling us this story but we're taking on her role in the story as well and we just have to see her dealing with the foibles and eccentricities of the characters around her. This novel has such comedy in it, and she is definitely the every man within this comedy. And I adored it. I adored this tale of community. I adored a story that's somewhat quiet, but insightful. There is an element of wit here that doesn't overtake. There are one-liners in here. When the vicar was decorating and they started talking about the colour of distemper, I was just thrilled. I. I, I found a book that, whilst it's not like the most overly dramatic, it was nice and quiet and it talked about a place and time incredibly well and it talked about the war between high church and low church and it just, it captured the way that people gossip in society and I was particularly not thrilled by it but I was just extremely glad to have read this book and 
just to find something that matched my mood and matched my sensibilities. And I understood what the volunteer was saying to me after all this time. Barbara Pym isn't writing these exceptionally literary novels, but I still felt like I'd read something rather fantastic and I would easily revisit a Barbara Pym just for the sense of comfort that I got from it and also immediately I felt like the author knew what she was doing and so I had faith in the writer and so I just felt like I could ease along into the story without having to worry about where it was going to go. I just knew that I was in good strong hands when it came to the writing of this one. And I do, you know, this, the volunteer who's been talking to me about Barbara Pym is the same volunteer who stole a copy of Barbara Pym when we went out for Christmas. So I'm looking forward to getting to that in future. Not this month, I might, I might treat Barbara Pym the same way I plan to treat Elizabeth Taylor. And maybe I'll read the next Barbara Pym next month and then return to Elizabeth Taylor because I have all of her books to get through and then come back to Barbara Pym. Thank you to Sean and Sarah for recommending this book because you are right. This is certainly brilliant. Now I would like to move on to some books that I got from the library. I arrived pretty early last Thursday. I just walked I'd walked Sally and my knee wasn't feeling the best and it was quite hot. So I just said to my father, because I had this really hefty rucksack to carry, could he give me a lift? And he was leaving right then and there. So I had to be there an hour before I needed to be. <sighs> now this book I've had for a while, but I'm going to pretend that I got it last week, but I'm actually 25 pages in to Behind the Scenes at the Museum by Kate Atkinson. This is the first novel that Kate Atkinson ever released and I got this book when I was reading Case Histories and that's when I decided just to take a bit of a break from Kate Atkinson simply because I was recognising similarities in her plots and in her stories. But I do think that I'm going to try and read behind the scenes at the museum this month. Similar to the, when I was talking about Barbara Pym, I found with Kate Atkinson, I just really enjoy reading her prose so there's part of me that thinks that I get part of me gets frustrated with the fact that a lot of times the stories can be quite similar and I see similar scenes in the books and then another part of me thinks but as a fan of Kate Atkinson isn't it just nice just to have this faith in the writer that you're going to enjoy their books and that you can just feel safe in the knowledge that you're going to read something good because with Kay Atkinson there's never been anything so far that I have wholeheartedly despised and I don't think there will be and I think that were it not for the fact that I've been reading so many of them this year it's basically going to work out at about one a month that I probably wouldn't have had the same issues that I'm having now had these book, you know, had I read them in publication order. I mean, I don't think I would have read Behind the Scenes at the Museum when I was five. Uh, I, I definitely didn't want to read it when I was 16, but I really do want to read it now. I got Skandar and the Unicorn Thief by A.F. Stedman. This is because I keep seeing mention of this children's book everywhere. Some people have likened it to a popular book series from when I was a child. And even though I am an adult, even though I am in my third decade, I do rather enjoy reading a magical adventure story. Having discovered how popular this book is, I thought I'd give it a go. So we have Heroes and Unicorns as you've never seen them before. Skandar Smith has only ever wanted to be a unicorn rider. But just as his dream is about to come true, things take a dangerous turn. A dark and twisted enemy has stolen the world's most powerful unicorn, and as the threat grows ever closer, Skandar discovers a secret that could blow apart his world forever. Get ready for unlikely heroes, elemental magic, sky battles, ancient secrets and ferocious unicorns in this epic adventure series that will have your heart soaring. Now I have to watch out with books like this because if I read a good children's book it often inspires me to go back to my own children's book uh, which I absentmindedly abandoned five years ago, nearly six actually, and people always ask me when I'm going to go back to that and I just have to say 
I'm writing it as fun. And so whenever I get the want and need to go to it, I do. And that just hasn't happened for a while. But yeah, sometimes re really good children's adventure fiction can set me down the path of going back and writing my own children's adventure novel. And I have to watch out because I'm currently working on a lot of stuff and I don't have the time to divert to George Peregrine. Uh, then I got In Memoriam by Alice Wynn because Charlie got In Memoriam by Alice Wynn and we've decided we're going to buddy read it and we only have until the 20th because that's when it's due back at the library for Charlie. But in 1914, war feels far away to Henry Gaunt, Sidney Elwood and the rest of their classmates safely ensconced in their idyllic boarding school in the English countryside. At 17, they're too young to enlist, and anyway, Gaunt is busy fighting his own private battle, an all-consuming infatuation with his best friend, the dreamy, poetic Alwood, not having a clue that Alwood is in love with him and always has been. When Gaunt's German mother asks him to enlist in the British Army to protect the family from anti-German attacks, Gaunt signs up immediately, relieved to escape his overwhelming feelings for Alwood. The front is horrific, of course, and though Gaunt tries to dis dissuade Elwood from following him to the battlefield, Elwood soon rushes to join him. Once in the trenches, Elwood and Gaunt find fleeting moments of solace in each other, but their friends are all dying in front of them, and at any moment they could be next. An epic tale of both the devastating tragedies of war and the forbidden romance that blooms in its grip, In Memoriam is a breathtaking debut. I have to admit, I find it intriguing. I get a bit frustrated by the size of the font in here and how small the margins are and the fact that it isn't justified in certain places but we will find out why I think that's just because of certain diary entries in here now again we could see me if I get on with that book I could go to this which is Fighting Proud by Stephen Bourne the untold story of the gay men who served in two world wars just for some more non-fiction context and books kind of piggybacking on one another's themes. And then finally, I got Her Majesty's Royal Coven by Juno Dawson. And so the blurb here is, Hidden Among Us is a secret coven of witches. Known as Her Majesty's Royal Coven, they protect crown and country from magical forces and otherworldly evil. But their greatest enemy will come from within. There are whisperings of a prophecy that will bring the coven to its knees and four best friends are about to be caught at the centre. Will Helena, Neve, Leonie and Al be able to stop the prophecy before it's too late? Or will the differences that have seen them grow apart since childhood be too great to overcome? Life as a modern witch was never simple, but now it's about to get apocalyptic. In terms of the witchcraft element, it does remind me somewhat of a TV show from about 10 years ago, which I think was called Switch, starred Lacey Turner amongst other people and was about four witches in a coven. And I believe each one was a different elemental. Either way... This reminds me of that in some way. And I also got it, one, because I hadn't seen it at the library before, and two, because for whatever reason, I've decided I want to do a pink reading vlog. And this is why we have a gap on the shelf here. Last month, I ended up reading two yellow books consecutively. And that got me to thinking, even though I've not been doing vlogs, a book that I want to read this month is Outrageous by Paul Baker. Paul Baker wrote Fabulosa, which was one of my favourite books that I read last year. And Outrageous is the story of Section 28 and Britain's battle for LGBT education, as it says on here. So many people are reading this book this month. And so many people have said that this is one of their favourites and of the year so far. And because of that, I really want to get to it. I was thrilled by the way that Paul Baker managed to almost create a storyline for the Polari language with Fabulosa. And I'm interested to see what he does with Section 28 in Outrageous, because I can't help but feel like we're going to get some moments of memoir, but we're also going to get all these different accounts and how he'll create a narrative from that that almost creates the propulsive voice that I knew from Fabulosa. So I'm looking forward to this. But I didn't mean for it to be a year between me reading Fabulosa and that. Again, I got uh, The Velvet Rage by Alan Downs, PhD, at the same time last year. And this, again, is 
the groundbreaking, life-changing guide for every gay man, which is an empowering book that has already changed the public discourse on gay culture and helped shape the identity of an entire generation of gay men. And I got both these books from Queer Lit last year. Knew that I wanted to read them, but I just haven't got to them yet. Um, which seems to be the way I, I do this with tea and I do it with books from Queer Lit. I just bulk buy. Now, with that in mind, there was some other books that I wanted to get to that also happened to be pink and then I was just like, do you know what? This pile of pink possibilities is what we're going, I'm going to create a vlog this month. I don't know when, I um, don't know how it's going to work, but I know that I want to create a vlog. It's going to be me reading pink books and we're going to see, but I also wanted to read An Ordinary Wonder by Buki Papillon because Charlie sent this to me two years ago. An Ordinary Wonder is a story of the courage needed to be yourself. Otto leaves a boarding school with one plan, excel and escape his cruel home. Falling in love with his roommate was certainly not on the agenda, but fear and shame force him to hide his true love and true self. Back home, weighed down by the expectations of their wealthy and powerful family, the love of Otto's twin sister wavers, and as their world begins to crumble around them, Otto must make drastic choices that will alter the family's lives forever. Richly imagined with art, proverbs and folk tales, this moving and modern novel follows Otto through life at home and at boarding school in Nigeria, through the heartbreak of living as a boy despite their, despite their profound belief they are a girl, and through a hunger for freedom that only a new life in the United States can offer. It sounds brilliant! Why is it taking Charlie so long? I don't know. I want to get to You Made a Fool of Death with Your Beauty. Just because! <laughs> I really do like Emezi's prose, and... Charlie and I were discussing this yesterday where I nearly unhauled everything I own by this author despite the fact that I enjoy their prose simply because I didn't get on with the death of Vivek uh, So, But a lot of people really enjoyed this. And so this could be read this month. As could Moon Witch Spider King by Marlon James. <clears throat> I read Black Leopard Red Wolf many moons ago. I now own two copies of Moon Witch Spider King because my original copy did not match. This is not my original copy. This is one that Charlie found for me and sent to me. So I now own two because both of them are a bit battered and I haven't decided which one is the least battered one for me to keep. I know that Black Leopard Red Wolf was incredibly dark, but I remember the narrator's voice being so strong that I could Oh, it, it stuck in my mind and I can remember very vivid scenes from that book that despite the fact that they were dark they stuck with me and so I could get to this this month again the this is these are only possibilities and then I have Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead which I kept putting on TBRs last year. It's been on a few this year. And Charlie says that I've talked about liking this book so much, despite the fact that I haven't read it, that she's certain now that I'm not going to like it. I nearly added How to Kill Your Family by Bella Mackey, simply because I know I'm not going to like this, but my mother got it me for my birthday last year, and I want to read it so that I can give it to my sister and never have to have it on my shelves again. So my question to you is, out of those pink books, which ones should I prioritise? Uh, three that are definitely going to be there are Outrageous, The Velvet Rage and Her Majesty's Royal Common. Uh, but feel free to pick and choose and put your vote forward for whichever of the other ones you think that I should read. Obviously, this could actually make up the entirety of my June reading. However, I have been reading a lot fewer books this month, as evidenced by the fact that I'm only coming to you with excellent women to talk about. It's just the way that the days have gone. So when I finished recording last Wednesday, I then edited the video, and then Thursday I spent my time walking the dog and writer's group, and then I met a colleague for a drink. Friday, Saturday I'm in work, and I just, I just don't have that thing about me to read. And maybe that's the thing, maybe I should start listening to audiobooks more in the car like I was doing before, as opposed to just listening to my Spotify playlist, which, to be fair, I have changed a bit recently because <laughs> I get so fed up of the same songs being played over and over again. So we might be changing it to the We Free Men this week, and that would add us maybe another book, because 
the way I listen to it, I've only got three hours of it left. So I could get some of that done. We'll see when I next speak to you whether I've actually followed through on that. But I would like to finish the Discworld series this year, I think. I'd also like to listen to some more Douglas Adams and get the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series done. So maybe I'll do that as well. So let's talk about my own writing. I have been writing more poetry since I last spoke to you, but not a lot of writing has been happening with Alice Valentine. Uh, this is only because of what I've just talked about. Once again, I've just found that I've only been able to write in bed. So that's after 11 o'clock at night and usually I'm a bit knackered. So I've only been, I've probably written about six pages since I last spoke to you, which is not what I wanted. I'd really got this great rate going on where I was writing at least a thousand words every day, a thousand to two thousand words really. And I'd hope to, as I said to you, finish this book by August, but hopefully um, earlier than that. I still think that I'm on track to do that because I only need to write about 25,000 words now. <sighs> but we will see because as we know, work can get in the way. I have overtime next week due to the fact that a colleague is on holiday and also these poems keep happening. And I'm, I'm not mad about that because I think that you have to write what you're inspired to write when that inspiration comes and I don't really want to let it pass me by. And I just, I'm really enjoying telling these character stories in the poetic form and it makes a nice aside from when I am working on these bigger pieces. But that's that really. As I say, I've, I've only got a few hours to prepare for poems and pints and I still need to put a, a running order together for that. So I might just hot foot it off right now. Uh, however, oh wait, I, I could say that I've actually been re-watching Last of the Summer Wine because they've got back to the old episodes again. Uh, series three started airing today on Gold, which is where Brian Wilde first appears as Foggy. And I do get enjoyment out of watching the, that episode. There's great nostalgia when it comes to Last of the Summer Wine for me, but it's also, I think, one of the shows that my father doesn't mind putting on because it's one of those times when I'll watch it and I tend to be quiet when it comes to watching uh, because I just enjoy the way that Roy Clark does comedy. Something else that I've been enjoying is I Didn't Know You Cared, which was a Tinniswood comedy from the 1970s. And this was one where I recall that somebody at university, my script writing tutor at university, said that I had a Tinniswood ear for language. And going back and now seeing what this tutor meant, I I have to agree. I, I Not to be tooting my own horn here, but I think that the voice that I have is very much inspired by classic British comedy. And I'm noticing some of the same rhythms, the same cadences and the same speech. But I suppose this could just be saying that really, whereas I've been championing Northern voices all these years, uh, the voice that I've really emulated the most is the Yorkshire voice, which is fine. Uh, apart from the fact that when I was reading at the last Poems and Pads, someone came across and asked whether I was from Yorkshire. And I didn't realise that my poetry reading voice goes so northern that it translates as being from the other side of the bloody Pennines. <sighs> but that's me. If you have read any of these books and think that I should prioritise some over others, then please feel free to let me know in the comments. Similarly, as I say, let me know which of the pink books I should include in that vlog that I'm planning for a few weeks' time. I say this, but we never got to see those vlogs recorded last year, so there's every chance I'll record it and it'll just linger on my computer. Who can be sure? Charlie is unreliable. I... You know, what are you reading? What are you writing? What are you watching? What are you listening to? I hope that you have got something out of this video be besides sheer boredom, despite sheer boredom. I don't know. We've been in the corner with all of my postcards. But until next time, that is all.